Hello everyone. Finally, this is going to be the last video before we start getting into pick microcontrollers. I know there are too many explanations for people with some background, but these videos are for absolute beginners for a reason. And I always include timestamps for you to skip to any part that you're interested in. In this video, I'll give you some MPLAB and C knowledge useful for microcontrollers that are kind of hidden behind the IDE. So, let's get started. As I said in the previous videos, if you don't know the basics of C language, I suggest watching a simple couple hour long C lesson on YouTube to at least grasp the basics. I'll try explaining each and every line of code in the future, but I won't go into too much detail, so coming with some basic knowledge will help you a lot if you are clueless. Also, Microchip Developer website has a list of visual documentations that are great in my opinion, link of which I'll put in the description, which you can check out along with hundreds of C tutorials out there if you have a question. And as for pointers in C, you can hold off for a bit before learning them, if it's too difficult. I probably won't use them for a while, but know that pointers are essential for C. It can get complicated if you don't know how computers operate on a silicon level. However, not knowing pointers is like not knowing 70-80% to 80 of the language, and I'll use it extensively in the future too. So I put down a link below for a really great tutorial you can watch. It's long, but it covers everything, even the things you'll probably not use. I suggest watching it at some point. I can't make a tutorial myself since this is a PIC microcontroller series, and the C language would need its own series separately. Let's get to the code at hand. For people with Arduino knowledge, you know that Arduino has two major code blocks, which are named setup and loop, where setup is executed once and is used to initialize things, while loop is executed on a loop and houses your main code, right? Well, you don't have that here. There are no setup or loop functions. Instead, in C language, there's a special function called main, the one you can see on the screen now. The main function is special in that a project must have a function called main, but also not more than one of it. Main is the function that will be called on program start and is a special function because of that. So you can think of it as your setup function in Arduino. And typically you would put a while one loop like this at the end of your main function, which would be your loop function equivalent of an Arduino. Now, note that we are not using Arduino. The IDE will help you, but won't hold your hand nearly as much. You are free to code whatever you want, wherever you want. Unlike Arduino, you don't have to actually put this while one loop here. You may have a rare use case where you only want this program to execute once, then you can leave this while one loop out and there's nothing wrong with that. But know this, if you just let the main function run and get to its ending point, the microcontroller will simply reset and start from scratch. Let's check the assembly code loaded onto the microcontroller. I've talked about reading the microcontroller in the previous video, so watch that if you don't understand what I'm doing. Go to Window tab and navigate to Target Memory Views, then Program Memory. If you scroll down, you'll see our code. And no, you don't have to read the microcontroller to see this if you just program the same microcontroller. This page will automatically show you the program you loaded onto that microcontroller. You only need to do a read operation when a microcontroller is programmed from a separate source. Here at the very bottom, you can see that the compiler automatically added a jump command to the beginning of our code. This is a measurement taken just in case by the compiler to protect your circuit. Different functions can be stored on different parts of your program memory, and if you let the program run off and execute everything in its way, that could be disastrous for your circuit. So if you let your microcontroller exit from the main function, it will just reset back to the beginning. But don't see this as a replacement for the while one loop. This will go all the way back to your main function, meaning it will initialize everything all over again, instead of executing the code part you want. If you go to address 0, as the assembly command written here suggests, you'll see another go to command. It makes us jump to FF84, so let's go there as well. And here you can see that the microcontroller is doing initializations, including parts of our code from the main function. So you see, it pretty much makes the code start from scratch. Instead of exiting the main function, you can make the microcontroller sleep or halt using this command. Or simply put an empty while one loop to stop it from executing anything. Or make it loop around the code block of your choice like before. Let's get back to our code. The main function can return anything, but returning from main is the same as exiting your program, so it doesn't make sense to return anything. Just keep its return type as void to not waste memory space for no reason, but it should get optimized automatically by the compiler anyways. This void here is not necessary either, since this is not a function prototype, but the MPLAB automatically puts it here. You can delete it if you want. The same goes for this return. You can delete it if you want, since exiting the main function just resets the code anyways. You should know about header files, but let me go through them just in case anyways. You include header files like this. 
Double quotes are used if the header file exists in the same directory as the file you're writing this include statement onto. It will automatically search this file's directory and find the name of the header file you're trying to include. If you go to Files tab, you can see that source and header files are stored in the same location. So for your project's header files, you can use double quotes and type the name directly like this. And these angled brackets are used if it's a system file you're trying to include. You use this form when you are including files that come with the compiler like the .h here. If you wanted to include a file that is in another subdirectory in your project, you can put the path that comes after the current file location like this. Or if you wanted to include a file from anywhere on your computer, you can include using this whole file path like this. Before we continue, let me explain what preprocessor means. The preprocessor is a process that prepares your code before compilation. Preprocessor handles all preparations prior to compilation, meaning before any code gets compiled or read, the preprocessor terms, which are the terms that use hash in their beginning, will be handled first. Let's go into the header file using the control left click shortcut I talked about in the previous video. The way the header files work is that, you can think of the code here being copy pasted instead of the include statement, like this. The include statement redirects the preprocessor to look at that file instead. So header files are used to organize your code so it's not a huge mess in one file. Because it acts like a copy-paste code, you can write your whole code here too. You can write functions, define variables, make calculations, and you wouldn't get an error. But by convention, you put constants, macros, system-wide global variables, and function prototypes only. If you go against the convention, your code will still probably work, but you'll also probably get yelled at. So I suggest following it. Also, in header files, you see this if and def and define pair. These are called header guards. If your header file needs including on multiple files in the same project, which is very common, you wouldn't want the compiler to process that header file more than once, which would cause errors. This is why you define what is called macros, which is this term. This is generated automatically whenever you create a header file, so you don't have to worry about writing it yourself. The if and def stands for if not defined. This term checks if the macro is defined or not. And if it is, it makes the preprocessor skip to the end of the code block and doesn't let the file be processed by the compiler. But if the macro isn't defined yet, it lets the preprocessor get into the code block and the compiler will process it no problem. But at the beginning of the code, you generate this exact macro. So you see, with this guard, this header file will be processed once and once only. Of course, this if in def term needs termination for the code block to form, which is the end if term at the bottom here. And again, note that all of these commands use hash symbol in their beginning, which indicates that they are meant for the preprocessor. Especially if you are migrating from Arduino, you might think that Boolean variables exist. Boolean variables are variables that have only two states, one or zero, or true or false. But in reality, Boolean variables don't exist. Computers can't move around a single bit like that. They use registers of their bit size, like 8-bit, 16-bit, and etc. So Boolean variables are just the variable of the shortest size usable by that microcontroller. If I type bool here to define a boolean, it will give me an error. Because booleans don't come with C compilers. You can create your own boolean using typedef and enumerators like this. But there's an easier way to do this. Just use the library that comes with the C compilers called stdbool.h. If you control click this file and open it, you can see that the typically used true and false statements are created using simple define statements and the bool is linked to the term underscore bool using a define statement. Underscore bool is used by later C standards, so it's already defined by C. You can use this term directly or use the normal bool with lowercase, it's up to you. I'll be using an 8-bit microcontroller in these videos, which means that the native register sizes for this microcontroller is 8 bits long. But 8-bit signed values can only represent between minus 128 to 127. We can't possibly make any meaningful calculations with such small values. But luckily, in math, the operations can be divided into sections, which is what computers use to calculate big numbers. The way it's done is beyond the scope of this video, but what you need to know is that if you need to make calculations for a value that can't be fit in 8 bits, we can use multiple 8-bit registers to store this value, and use different algorithms to make this calculation. That is also why for an 8-bit microcontroller we can have 16, 32, or 64 bits long variable types. They are represented using multiple registers cascaded together. Another thing to note before I continue is that, by default, you don't need to type the signed keyword. Any variable by default is signed, 
meaning if I type int or char like this, these values are automatically of the type signed int and signed char. But to make them unsigned, you need to use the unsigned term before them like this. Now, unlike computers we use in our everyday lives, microcontrollers come with different register sizes, which are commonly 8, 16, or 32 bits. The C language uses char, int, long, and etc. to represent different variable sizes. But these terms don't exactly tell you how many bits they represent, right? Normally, an integer type's length is defined as the native register size for the given microcontroller, which results in the most efficient code in general, since int type is the most frequently used data type. So for a 16-bit microcontroller, int represents 16 bits, and for a 32-bit microcontroller, int represents 32 bits. However, even though you'd think that an int represents 8 bits for an 8-bit microcontroller, that is not the case. Int on the XC8 compiler has the size of 16 bits, meaning 2 bytes. This is because C language doesn't let int type to be shorter than 16 bits, so if you want to make your code as efficient as possible, you're better off using char variables, which are commonly 8 bits, assuming the calculations can fit in a char variable. But there's a better solution to all of this if you prefer. You can include the library stdint.h, which stands for standard integer. With this library, you can use these six terms. With these, you can be sure that an int 8 represents 8 bits, and int 16 represents 16 bits. If you click on them, you can see that int 8 is defined as char for this microcontroller, and char for this microcontroller is indeed 8 bits. You can also check all the other terms as well if you're interested, but I'll skip it here. The underscore t at the end of their name are used by convention. Underscore t at the end of a defined word tells you that they represent a type meaning they were defined using typedef keyword, which you can confirm by going to their source. The letter U at the beginning of the bottom half stands for unsigned. The uint stands for unsigned int, while int stands for normal int, which is signed by default. You'll also see int underscore fast and int underscore least terms defined as well. You probably won't use these, but may as well explain them. For example, int underscore fast 16 term would mean the fastest bit size for the given hardware that is at least 16 bits long. And you know that this microcontroller is 8 bits, so the fastest bit size that is at least 16 bits long would still be 16 bits long. And if we go to its source, you'll see that its definition is the same as int 16. As for the int underscore least terms, for example, the term int underscore least 16 would mean the smallest bit size that is at least 16 bits long, which is again 16 bits. If we go to its source, its definition is the same as int16 as well. One last thing, you'll also have the terms underscore max and underscore min defined for each type of int, which refer to the highest and lowest representable values for that given type. For example, int16 underscore max is defined as the maximum value representable by that type, which is 16 bits long and signed, meaning the maximum representable value should be 32,767. And if we go to its source, you'll see that this hex value is defined as this term, which is indeed 32,767. There are times when you want to make a variable and not have its value changed. Most common example would be the pi number. This is when you would use a constant variable. Const keyword is used to turn a variable into a constant one, and it's a convention to name your constant variables with all capitals. Sometimes using this constant keyword makes more sense, but that is very rare. In a computer where the lack of RAM is usually not a concern, a variable or two defined as constants won't hurt. However, in microcontrollers where your resources are very limited, defining constant variables like this is usually not desirable. The problem is that these variables are physically stored in your microcontroller. Instead, the better way to do this is by using the define preprocessor statement. You know that if you instead define pi as 3.14 using a define statement, the preprocessor would go around replacing the word pi with 3.14. And when you think about it, this is exactly the purpose of a constant variable. But this time, we don't use any microcontroller memory to store this value, instead use the preprocessor to accomplish the same thing. So most of the time, using the define statement instead of the constant statement is better. However, there are situations in which you may want to store this constant value in which case the constant keyword would be the way to go. But you should always consider using the define statement first before considering constant statement. In MPLAB, you can add descriptions to your functions, which you should always do. 
even if you're the only one that will see the code. Even you won't remember your functions after a couple of days. Let me make another source file to put our example function into. And by the way, you should always keep your other functions in their own separate source files. As I've said in the previous video, you can make subdirectories inside the main tabs on the left to organize your files further. You don't have to, but if possible, you should make individual source files for each of your functions, especially for longer projects. I'm just going to make a simple function that takes two variables and subtracts the second one from the first, then returns it. Let's go back to our main file. By the way, if you want to use this function here, you need to make a prototype of that function in this file, but we're not going to use it anyway, so I won't. If you start to type the name of the function here and click Ctrl Spacebar to open up the autocomplete menu, you'll see that our function has no description. This isn't good. To write a description to your function, go to its declaration and write a comment right above it. And yes, the comment has to be right above the declaration. Let's save the file, which you can easily do by pressing Ctrl and S. Let's go back to our main file. After writing the function, you can still click on it and press Ctrl and Spacebar to open up its description. And as you can see, our description shows up here now. But this isn't exactly descriptive, is it? What should be the parameters, and how do we add that? MPLab has a way for you to do this in a simple way. MPLab implements a simple javadoc comment block. You can type it yourself, but there's a shortcut for it. Put your cursor right above the function declaration and type forward slash asterisk asterisk, then press enter. MPLab will automatically pick up your past and return variables and put them here. This is the format, and you can make additions to this as you like. Write your function's description here. Then write the descriptions for your variables like this. You don't have to, but I like putting a column after the variable name to not mix it with the description. Save the file. Now if we go to see our function description, you can see that it holds information about everything we need. And again, you can make more additions to this as you like. One last thing. If you have multiple projects open on the left, which one do you think is built when you press the build button? It's certainly not the file you have open, since you can have files open from multiple projects at the same time. If you hover over the build or program buttons, you'll see that they say main project at the end. Only one project at a time is selected as the main project. We can tell which project is the main by checking their names on the left. The one that is selected as the main project will be written with bold characters. We can right click on a project to set it as the main. And as you can see, now this project is written with bold characters instead. I've set this operation to a shortcut, which is Ctrl and D. But this is not default. You can do this by navigating to Tools tab, Options, Key Map, and find the Set as Main Project operation here and give it a shortcut if you want. I've talked about this in the second video in this series. And that's the end of the video, and thank you for watching. If you liked the video, you can always leave a like and subscribe, it's always appreciated, and I'll see you in the next video.